Today, I start my first series for the year. And uh, as you know, uh, this year, our theme is God. And I intend to teach uh, a lot uh, in that direction. And uh, our uh, main theme verse for the, uh, our, uh, for the year is in Genesis 1.1. So I'm going to start from there. So today I start my God series, and this is uh, God 1. Uh, and, and next week, of course, I'll do number two of the series. My subtitle is The Eternal, The Eternal. Uh, that means that I'm going to talk about uh, God and his eternal nature. And uh, we're going to spend time to understand what it means when we say God is eternal and what it means for us as Christians to know God as eternal. One of the difficulties uh, or, or the, the observations I've made about uh, many of us Christians is that we want God to do things for us. We expect things from him. We talk to him. We pray. But we know very little about the nature of God. And so pretty soon we get disappointed about things uh, and we get confused about things because we don't truly understand this God that we worship this God that we talk to, this God that we pray to. So I hope that this series will help us to understand God and to know how he deals with us. And, and so that our, our prayer, our study, our expectation will all be right. So God the eternal. We go to our key verse for the year. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, I believe Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is the most important verse in the Bible. It is the most important because everything else in the Bible stands on this verse. Uh, without this verse, nothing else in the Bible stands. Everything is premised on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It tells us everything about what life is all about. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is God's self-introduction to us. Uh, as he helps us to know who he is uh, from this verse. And uh, I've taught a lot from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, I, can, I can say confidently that I can teach on this verse for a very long time uh, because there are different aspects I can, and perspectives I can bring on it. But for the meantime, I'm not going to stay with Genesis 1, 1 for the rest of the year. I will deal with it this week. Next week, I will also go back to Genesis 1, 1 and deal with another aspect of it. So, today we want to look at, from Genesis 1-1, the most important thing we want to look at is that God is eternal. Everybody say it together. God is eternal. Let's say it like we are in church. God is eternal. That's a very important statement because that's one of the important things we see from Genesis 1-1, that God is eternal. There are other words uh, that can be used uh, as synonyms for eternal. Words like everlasting or forever, endless, infinite. All of it, in a sense, are talking about the same thing, although sometimes there's a difference. But God is eternal can be seen as everlasting. God is forever. God is endless. Uh, God is infinite. Now, it's very difficult for us as human beings to think of anything as eternal because our human experience tells us that nothing is forever. Uh, things start and they end. Uh, and so for a human being to think of something as eternal, eternal is it's just an amazing thought. It's very difficult 
to, to imagine what it means. The, the other time I was watching a documentary on the longest living things. It was part of my research as I was going to preach this message. Uh, some of the longest living things, things that have lived uh, for a long time uh, on this earth. And, and most of them were plants or trees. Uh, a few were uh, sea creatures. There is actually one jellyfish that is supposed to be immortal in the sense that it renews its life um, every time. And there are trees that uh, have lived for thousands of years. Uh, and so in a sense, you say, you can think of eternal. If you look at that tree, you can say, oh, that's eternal. But you know, a tree that has lived for 10,000 years, 5,000 years, 3,000 years can easily be cut and bent. So it's not eternal. Its life can come to an end. And even the jellyfish that is supposed to be able to renew its life, uh, somebody can catch it and fry it. And, and that's the end of its eternity. So no longer how, no matter how long something lives on this earth, just one moment, a wind will blow it, fire will burn it, something is going to end it, and it will no longer be eternal. Last year in May, uh, that's 2023, uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, those of you who know Sierra Leone, there's a big cotton tree uh, that the Sierra Leoneans uh, consider uh, as eternal. It's been there. In fact, uh, people have composed songs about how enduring that tree is. It's, uh, it's been there for over 400 years. And last year, uh, there was a windstorm, and the tree fell down after 400 years. This year, I read uh, that a tree that is supposedly was uh, planted by Confuanoche somewhere in Ashanti that has 300 years, just some people just went and cut it down. So, so, so when, <laughs> no, that when we talk about God as eternal, he cannot be cut down, he cannot be bent, he cannot be fried, a storm cannot move him, he's there all the time. That's the eternity of God. God is eternal. And when we say God is eternal, we mean that he is, has always been, and will always be. He is, has always been, and will always be. You cannot say that about anything that we know. Now, of course, human beings uh, use the word eternal and forever in many ways. People for, say for things like, I'm eternally grateful to you. I'm eternally grateful to you. But you know that word eternal is used in a very subjective sense because if you tell somebody, I'm eternally grateful to you, your gratitude started from somewhere when the person did you good. Before he did you good, you were not grateful, so your gratitude cannot be eternal. It has a beginning, and it will end the day he disappoints you. You'll cut it down. And people say things like, you are my best friend forever. You know that he's not your best friend forever. He was not your best friend in the womb. He was not the best friend when you were born. He was your best friend with you, whom you met maybe three years ago in secondary school. And one day they will offend you and you say, we have cut our relationship. We are no longer best friend. Now, I don't want you to think of God when we say God is eternal, God is forever, God is infinite. I don't want you to... To, to apply this kind of human uh, description of forever, eternal, and infinite to God. Because sometimes we do. And so uh, some, I've heard some people say, God has disappointed me. You know, uh, and it's because we don't understand uh, eternal in the God sense as we should. So, Genesis 1-1 again, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going to explain uh, a little bit beyond uh, eternal and what it means uh, in, in, in this sense. Two important theological words, and I've used those words a few times in this pulpit. The first one is that when we say God is eternal, we mean he's transcendent. He's transcendent. It's one word you should always know, transcendent. What does it mean? It means he exists beyond and outside of all creation. He exists beyond and outside of all creation. When I say that a, a tree is eternal, 
It doesn't exist beyond creation because it is part of creation. When we say that, oh, this statue is forever, it can't be forever because it was made from the earth. Nothing in the universe can claim to be forever because it has a beginning. But when we say God is eternal, we mean he's transcendent. He goes beyond anything and everything that has been created. He goes beyond it. He exists beyond and outside of creation. There is nothing you know that exists outside of creation. Everything you know is inside of creation. Whether it's tables or mountains or rivers or the sun or the moon or planets or galaxies, they all are inside of creation. But God is outside of creation. He's outside. So we say he is transcendent. Let's say that together. Transcendent. And also means that God does not derive any aspect of his being from outside himself. There's no part of God that comes outside of God. There's no part of God that comes outside of God. What does that mean? It means God is God all by himself. He is not made God. He is God all by himself. He is self-existing. He is self-sufficient. He is self-sustaining. He does not depend on anything to be God. And he has no need of anything. God does not need worship in order to be God. We worship him, but he doesn't need it. Whether we worship him or not, he is God. He was who he was before human beings were created for us to be able to worship him. He was who he was before angels were created before they could worship him. God does not need worship. God does not need sacrifice. You know, if you study other religions, most gods need sacrifice. The sacrifice is called the food of the gods. Uh, and so if you don't feed the gods for a long time, they get very angry. You know, and sometimes, you know, in our tradition, uh, a, a priest of a, a deity would say, the gods are angry, that's why uh, they caused an accident, because they need blood. They need to be fed. If they are not fed, they starve and go out of existence. God doesn't need sacrifice. He doesn't need worship. He doesn't need your praise. He doesn't even need you to believe in him. He needs nothing. Why? Because if God needs something, we can use his need to manipulate him. Are you, are you getting it? it? It means if I withdraw what he needs, then I can now control him, then I become his God. But God needs nothing, so there is nothing you can do to control God. You cannot deny him of anything. He exists by him Self. God is transcendent. He does not need his creation. He created it, but he doesn't need it. Because he was God before he created. So, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is telling us all of this about God. Because he's transcendent. He was there before the creation came. He existed before the creation so nothing in the creation can control him. You know, sometimes people, uh, especially when it comes to things like worship, you know, we, we use natural things to, to try to, to, to talk about God. And I understand the intention. It's not malicious, but it is heretic. Um, for example, people say, you know, it's like when you're sitting with your father and you want him to do something for you and you go and maybe uh, prepare his best food for him and then maybe you, you, you massage his feet and then you say, oh, daddy, I need this, I need this. And then as you do that, daddy, you say, okay, I'll give it to you. So that is how worship is. God is there and we are massaging him with, I love you, I praise you, I worship you. Oh, God, you are mighty. I want. As if God is an egotistical African despot who needs to be praised you know and once you say these things God will say oh okay now my son I'll give you that no because if you can do that to God he's not God you are God 
if your praise and your worship can turn him, then he is at your beck and call. But God is not at your beck and call. We are at his beck and call. God is transcendent. Everybody say God is transcendent. But he's not only transcendent, because he has created the world, and the world exists, and the universe exists, and people exist, he cannot be away and say, oh, I'm so transcendent, I'm not bothered about the things that are in the world, I don't care about the moon, I don't care about the stars, I don't care about the earth, I don't care about people. No, he cannot do that. So there is a second thing about God, God is immanent. God is Immanent. What does that mean? It means God is God actively works through and within his creation. He is not his creation, but he works through his creation. He's always aware of his creation. He's present in every part of his creation. He fills all time and all space. Of his creation. I like how David the psalmist puts it in Psalm 139 talking about God. He says Psalm 139 verse 7 to 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the light shines as the night shines as the day. Darkness and the light are both alike to you. Very profound words. So basically, David is saying that no part of God's creation can escape from his presence and his power. Though he's transcendent, no part of God's creation can escape. There's no corner of the universe that escapes from God. And if you listen to what David is saying, David says, if I go to the heavens, and he's not talking about heaven, the abode of God, of course, that would mean God is there. I mean, but he's talking about when I go to the heavens, that means if I travel in intergalactic space, I take on one of those Star Wars starships and I go at warp speed to some galaxy, he says God is there. I can't escape. If I go a billion miles into the universe, God is there. Then he says something interesting. He says, if I go to hell. You say, well, hell, the devil is there. God is, God is there. And by hell, David is not just talking about Satan's abode. He's talking about death. So David is saying, whether I'm alive or I am dead, God's presence surrounds me. That's awesome. In heaven, on earth, in hell, in death. He says, if I go to the uttermost part of the ocean and go to the deepermost part of the ocean, the deepest part, in the marina trench, I go to the deepest point of the ocean, God is there. You cannot outrun God's presence. You cannot stretch beyond God's presence. That's the eternal nature of God. When you are in darkness, he's there. When you are in the light, he's there. He's there at all times. So he's transcendent. He's beyond his creation, but he has not abandoned his creation. He's there at all times and in all places when
When you look through the Bible, God's names tell of his eternal nature. We say that God is the everlasting God. He revealed himself as I am. Sometimes it's called the ancient of days. It doesn't mean he's an old man. He's also called the living God. All these terms are expressing one idea, that God is eternal. And if you're going to build faith in God, this is where everything starts, the eternality of God. Without God's eternality, you can't even understand how he deals with us. So I'm going to give you three implications of the eternality of God. Practical application. What does it mean when we say God is eternal? The first implication is that God is always present. God is always present. He's never absent. And nothing can take him away. He's present in our moments of pain and suffering. He's present in our moments of joy and celebration. He's present when we feel lonely. He's present when we feel loved. He's present when there is crisis. He's present when there is peace. God is there. He's eternal. You can't switch him off. And for a believer, you have to understand, there is no moment in your life that God is not there. Many times we think God is there because we are happy. Oh, I just had a breakthrough. Oh, God is with me. And now I know God is with me because, you know, I prayed and the breakthrough came. Bah! Wow! Now I know God is there. Now that you know God is there, what if all the things are taken away from you? Will God go? No. When a child is born, God is there. When a person dies, God is there. He is not absent when we die, neither is he absent when we are born. God is ever present. There will be no time in your life that he is absent. That's the eternal God. He is always present. He is always present. The second implication of God's eternality is that God never changes. He is always God at all times. He is always God at all times. He is not half God, quarter God, three quarter God. God is always God at all times. He never changes. He's immutable. He's infinite. God never improves. God never becomes. God cannot be holier than the holy he is now. His holiness is fixed. His love is fixed. He cannot be more loving. He cannot be more holy. Because if he can be, then he is not. And if he is not, then he cannot say, I am. He can't improve. He cannot learn. So God cannot change. You know, sometimes people read the Bible and say, the God of the Old Testament, he was very harsh. But the God of the New Testament, he's very kind. As if God has improved over the ages. He's just looked at human beings and said, these people are so bad. If I hate them, I'll kill all of them. So now I'm going to be loving. No, no. God has been who he is at all times. His grace is the same. His mercy is the same. His love is the same. His compassion is the same. His power is the same. His goodness is the same. At all times, it will never improve. Human beings improve because we better, we learn, and then we improve ourselves. 
Trees grow. God doesn't grow. He is. He never changes. He never changes. And that's very important. And that's why we can trust him. In joy and in sorrow. In riches and in poverty. In all situations. The steadfast love of God never ceases. That's what Job understood. So when he lost everything, he knew God has not changed. God still loves me. I know that my Redeemer lives. I don't understand what has happened to me. I don't understand why all of a sudden I've lost everything. I don't understand why my children have died. I don't understand why my business collapsed. I don't understand all of that, but God never changes. And he loves me. He loves me when I have everything. He loves me when I lose everything. He loves me when I have good health. He loves me when my health is struggling. He loves me when I have a good time. He loves me when I have a bad time. God's love does not correspond to your experiences. Are you following me? Now, when you know that, you become steadfast in your faith, immovable. Through thick and thin, through water and fire. That's why the apostles of Jesus Christ never left him. That's why the prophets of old never left God. They were beheaded. They were eaten by lions. They were cut into two. They were burnt. But that never shook them. Because they understood the eternality of God. Because if you don't understand that, your Christianity will be circumstantial. When life is hard, I go to church. Life, life is hard, I go to church. When I get a breakthrough, I don't go to church. Some to do it opposite. When things are good, I go to church. Things are bad. Oh, these days I don't even know whether God is there. God, God's, you, you are saying God's there or not there. It's dependent on your there and not there. Because your money is not there, God is not there. Then guess who is your God? The money. Not the God of the Bible. If you get broke today, God is. And God has not loved you less. He has loved you with an eternal love. That's how he loves us. His love for us is eternal. He loves us eternally. So that's the second implication that God never changes. And the third and final implication. Because God is eternal, I can always experience God's presence. God is not far from me. I can talk to him anywhere. He can reach me anywhere and at any time. His presence is not limited to any spot on earth. He's not on a mountain. He's not in a valley. He's not in Jerusalem. He's not... Where else? Accra. He is... Of course, he's in Jerusalem, he's in Accra, he's everywhere. But you cannot confine the presence of God to a spot. You cannot. So all of you who go to places to seek for God, you don't understand his eternality. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go places. I mean, mean, if if you're a Christian and you want to go to Jerusalem to go and just observe the history of your faith and and the Old Testament and and the life of Christ and just know how these things happen in the historical context, that's great. If you go to Jerusalem and you go to the River Jordan, you say, oh, this is the water that uh, Jesus was baptizing. You say, oh, that's nice. Remember the water that he was baptizing has flowed long ago. It flowed long ago. So the one you are dipping is, is not the, the water. It's flowed long ago. 
But, you know, you just said that, okay, I mean, just for me to recognize that and for me to identify in Christ, I'll go and, and stand in the Jordan River. That's fine. I don't have problem with it. But if you stand in the Jordan River thinking that there's a special anointing there, you don't understand the eternality of God. All right? Now, if you go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem where uh, the last remnant of Mo, uh, Solomon's uh, temple and you just go and put your hands there, just for archaeological purpose. I, I love history and archaeology. Everywhere I go, I go to a museum. I'll go to some archaeological site because I'm very historical uh, by nature. So if you want to do that, that's fine. But if you think by touching that wall, you are closer to God, you are crazy. <laughs> you are crazy. There's something wrong with your head. Because God is eternal. His presence is not limited to the wailing wall. His presence is not limited to, the, to Jordan. You can go there and enjoy the historicity of your faith. But the reality of God, David says, he is the one who was in Jerusalem. He started Jerusalem. He says, when I go to the ends of the world, you are there. When I go to the skies, to the heavens, you are there. When I go to the place of death, you are there. Wherever I go, you are there. When I'm in darkness, you are there. When I'm in light, you are there. Nothing can hide God from you. God is eternal. Let's say that together. God is eternal. Say it one more time. God is eternal. For the last time. God is eternal. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. And that's your first lesson on God, that he is eternal. The Jews call him the eternal. The eternal. The king of the universe. He rules over the universe. He is everywhere at all times. And we cannot escape him. And we cannot escape his presence. Our belief in him or disbelief in him does not change his eternality. He will be God after all of us have left the earth. And after a whole generation comes, he will be God. He will be God if the whole world says, we don't believe in God. He will say, fine, but I am. We don't believe you are. He's not going to even prove himself. He is who he is at all times. And he is who he is before he created what we see now. And may the Lord help us to understand that he's eternal. He's changeless from age to age. He's the same. Let's talk to God. Let's pray just for a moment. Oh, yes, Lord. Just talk to him. Just talk to him. He hears you. Eternal God, we come to you. We thank you that you are who you are. You are the changeless one. Time does not change you. Space does not change you. Location does not change you. You are always who you are. Therefore, our trust is in you and our hope is in you. That even when things are dark, you are the light. When we are in the valley, you are there. When we are betrayed, you are there. When all men abandon us, you are there. When we feel no love, you love us. You never change. You never improve. You never become something else. You are always who you are in eternity. Help us, Father, to know you truly as you are, to grow in the knowledge of who you are, to love you and to serve you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen.